Chapter Five of Prejudice's First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudice's First Series by H. L. Mencken. Chapter Five. Professor Veblen. Ten or twelve years ago, being engaged in a bombastic discussion with what was then known as an intellectual socialist. Like the rest of the intelligentsia, he succumbed to the first Fife Corps of the war, pulled down the red flag, damned Marx as a German spy, and began whooping for Elihu Root, Otto Kahn, and Abraham Lincoln. I was greatly belabored and incommoded by his long quotations from a certain professor, Dr. Thorstein Veblen, then quite unknown to me. My antagonist manifestly attached a great deal of importance to these borrowed sagacities for he often heaved them at me in lengths of a column or two, and urged me to read every word of them. I tried hard enough, but found it impossible going. The more I read them, in fact, the less I could make of them, and so in the end, growing impatient and impolite, I denounced this Professor Veblen as a geyser of pishposh, refused to waste any more time upon his incomprehensible syllogisms, and applied myself to the other socialist witnesses in the case, seeking to set fire to their shirts. That old debate, which took place by mail, for the socialist lived like a munitions patriot on his country estate, and I was a wage slave attached to a city newspaper, was afterwards embalmed in a dull book, and made the mild pother of a day. The book by name, Men vs. the Man, is now as completely forgotten as Baxter's Saint's Rest, or the Constitution of the United States. I myself, perhaps the only man who remembers it at all, have not looked into it for six or eight years, and all I can recall of my opponent's argument beyond the fact that it not only failed to convert me to the nascent Bolshevism of the time, but left me a bitter and incurable scoffer at democracy in all its forms, is his curious respect for the aforesaid Professor Dr. Thorstein Veblen, and his delight in the learned gentleman's long, tortuous, and, to me at least, intolerably flapdoodleish phrases. There was indeed a time when I forgot even this when my mind was empty of the professor's very name. That was, say, from 1909 or thereabout to the middle of 1917. During those years, having lost all my old superior interest in socialism, even as an amateur psychiatrist, I ceased to read its literature and thus lost track of its great thinkers. The periodicals that I then gave an eye to, setting aside newspapers, were chiefly the familiar American imitations of the English weeklies of opinion, and in these the dominant great thinker was, first, the late Professor Dr. William James, and after his decease, Professor Dr. John Dewey. The reign of James, as the illuminated will recall, was long and glorious. For three or four years running he was mentioned in every one of those American spectators and Saturday reviews at least once a week, and often a dozen times. Among the less somber gazettes of the Republic, to be sure, there were other heroes. Matterlink, Rebendranath Tagore, Judge Ben B. Lindsay, and the late Major General Roosevelt, Tom Larson, and so on. Still further down the literary and intellectual scale there were yet others, Hall Caine, Bro, and Jack Johnson among them, with paper-bag cookery and the twilight sleep to dispute their popularity. But on the majestic level of the old nation, among the white and lavender peaks of professorial ratiocination, there was scarcely a serious rival to James. Now and then, perhaps, Jane Addams had a month of vogue, and during one winter there was a rage for Bergson, and for a short space the unspeakable Bernsdorf tried to set up Eucken, now damned with Wagner, Nietzsche, and Ludendorff. But taking one day with another, James held his own against the field. His ideas, immediately they were stated, became the ideas of every pedagogue from Harvard to Leland Stanford and the pedagogues, laboring furiously at space rates, rammed them into the skulls of the lesser cerebelli. To have called James an ass during the year 1909 would have been as fatal as to have written a sentence like this one without having used so many halves. He died a bit later, but his ghost went marching on. It took three or four years to interpret and pigeonhole his philosophical remains and to take down and redact his messages, via Sir Oliver Lodge, Little Bright Eyes, Wawa the Indian Chief, and other gifted psychics, from the spirit world. But then gradually he achieved the ultimate stupendous and irrevocable act of death, and there was a vacancy. 
To it, Professor Dr. Dewey was elected by the acclamation of all right-thinking and forward-looking men. He was an expert in pedagogics, metaphysics, psychology, ethics, logic, politics, pedagogical metaphysics, metaphysical psychology, psychological ethics, ethical logic, logical politics, and political pedagogics. He was Arsham Magister, Philosophi Doctor, and twice Legum Doctor. He had written a book called How to Think. He sat in a professor's chair and caned sophomores for blowing spitballs. Ergo, he was the ideal candidate, and so he was nominated, elected, and inaugurated, and for three years more or less he enjoyed a peaceful reign in the groves of sapience, and the inferior umbilicari venerated him as they had once venerated James. I myself greatly enjoyed and profited by the discourses of this Professor Dewey, and was in hopes that he would last. Born so recently as 1859, and a man of that highest bearable sobriety, he seemed likely to peg along until 1935 or 40, a gentle and charming volcano of correct thought. But it was not a last to be. Under cover of pragmatism, that serpent's metaphysic, there was unrest beneath the surface. Young professors in remote and obscure universities, apparently as harmless as so many convicts in the death house, were secretly flirting with new and red-hot ideas. Whole regiments and brigades of them yielded in stealthy privacy to rebellious and often incomprehensible yearnings. Now and then, as if to reveal what was brewing, a hell-fire blazed, and a professor Dr. Scott Nearing went sky-hooting through its smoke. One heard whispers of strange heresies, economic, sociological, even political. Gossip had it that pedagogy was hatching vipers, nay, was already brought to bed. But not much of this got into the homemade Saturday reviews and Yankee Athenaeums. A hint or two, maybe, but no more. In the main they kept to their old resolute demands for a pure civil service, the budget system in Congress, the abolition of hazing at the Naval Academy, and honest primary and justice to the Filipinos with extermination of the Prussian serpent added after August 1914. And Dr. Dewey, on his remote Socratic out, pursued the calm reinforcement of the philosophical principles underlying these and all other lofty and indignant causes. Then, of a sudden, sis! Boom! Ah! Then overnight the upspringing of the intellectual Soviets, the headlong assault upon all the old axioms of pedagogical speculation, the nihilistic dethronement of Professor Duty, and rah, rah, rah for Professor Dr. Thorstein Veblen. Veblen? Could it be? Aye, it was my old acquaintance, the Dr. Obscurus of my half-forgotten bout with the so-called intellectual socialist, the great thinker Redivivus. Here indeed he was again, and in a few months, almost it seemed a few days, he was all over the nation, the dial, the new republic, and the rest of them, and his books and pamphlets began to pour from the presses, and the newspapers reported his every wink and whisper, and everybody who was anybody began gabbling about him. The spectacle, I do not hesitate to say, somewhat disconcerted me and even distressed me. On the one hand, I was sorry to see so learned and interesting a man as Dr. Dewey sent back to the insufferable dungeons of Columbia there to lecture in imperfect Yiddish to classes of Grand Street Plato's. And on the other hand, I shrunk supinely from the appalling job newly rearing itself before me, of rereading the whole canon of the singularly laborious and muggy, the incomparably tangled and unintelligible works of Professor Dr. Thorstein Veblen. But if a sense of duty tortures a man, it also enables him to achieve prodigies. And so I managed to get through the whole infernal job. I read the theory of the leisure class, I read the theory of business enterprise, and then I read the instinct of workmanship. An hiatus followed. I was racked by a severe neuralgia with delusions of persecution. On recovering I tackled Imperial Germany and the Industrial Revolution. Malaria for a month, and then the nature of peace and the terms of its perpetuation. What ensued was never diagnosed. Probably it was some low infection of the mesentery or spleen. When it passed off, leaving only an asthmatic cough, I read The Higher Learning in America, and then went to Mount Clements to drink the Galber salts. Eureka! The business was done. It had strained me, but now it was over. Alas, a good part of the agony had been needless. 
What I found myself aware of coming to the end was that practically the whole system of Professor Dr. Beblin was in his first book, and his last, that is, in the theory of the leisure class, and the higher learning in America. I pass on the good news. Read these two and you won't have to read the others. And if even two daunt you, then read the first. Once through it, though you will have missed many a pearl and many a pain, you will have a fairly good general acquaintance with the gifted metaphysician's ideas. For these ideas in the main are quite simple and often anything but revolutionary in essence. What is genuinely remarkable about them is not their novelty or their complexity, nor even the fact that a professor should harbor them. It is the astoundingly grandiose and rococo manner of their statement, the almost unbelievable tediousness and flatulence of the gifted headmaster's prose, his unprecedented talent for saying nothing in an august and heroic manner. There are tales of an actress of the last generation, probably Sarah Bernhardt, who could put pathos and even terror into a recitation of the multiplication table. The late Louis James did something of the sort. He introduced limericks into Peer Gint, and still held the yokelry agape. The same talent raised to a high power is in this Professor Dr. Veblen. Tunnel under his great moraines and stalagmites of words, dig down into his vast kitchen midden of discordant and raucous polysyllables, blow up the hard, thick shell of his almost theological manner, and what you will find in his discourse is chiefly a mass of platitudes, the self-evident made horrifying, the obvious in terms of the staggering. Marx, I dare say, said a good deal of it, and what Marx overlooked has been said over and over again by his heirs and assigns. But Marx, at this business, labored under a technical handicap. He wrote in German, a language he actually understood. Professor Dr. Veblen submits himself to no such disadvantage. Though born, I believe, in these states, and resident here all his life, he achieves the effect, perhaps without employing the means of thinking in some unearthly foreign language, say, Swahili, Sumerian, or Old Bulgarian, and then painfully clawing his thoughts into a copious but uncertain and book-learned English. The result is a style that affects the higher cerebral centers like a constant roll of subway expresses. The second result is a sort of bewildered numbness of the senses, as before some fabulous and unearthly marvel. And the third result, if I make no mistake, is the celebrity of the professor as a great thinker. In brief, he states his hollow nothings in such high astounding terms that they must inevitably arrest and blister the right-thinking mind. He makes them mysterious. He makes them shocking. He makes them portentous. And so, flinging them at naive and believing minds, he makes them stick and burn. No doubt you think that I exaggerate, perhaps even that I lie. If so, then consider this specimen, the first paragraph of Chapter 13 of The Theory of the Leisure Class. In an increasing proportion as time goes on, the anthropomorphic cult, with its code of devout observances, suffers a progressive disintegration through the stress of economic exigencies and the decay of the system of status. As this disintegration proceeds, there comes to be associated and blended with the devout attitude certain other motives and impulses that are not always of an anthropomorphic origin, nor traceable to the habit of personal subservience. Not all of these subsidiary impulses that blend with the bait of devoutness in the latter devotional life are altogether congruous with the devout attitude or with the anthropomorphic apprehension of a sequence of phenomenon. Their origin being not the same, their action upon the scheme of devout life is also not in the same direction. In many ways they traverse the underlying norm of subservience or vicarious life to which the code of devout observances and the ecclesiastical and sacerdotal institutions are to be traced as their substantial basis. Through the presence of these alien motives, the social and industrial regime of status gradually disintegrates and the canon of personal subservience loses the support derived from an unbroken tradition. Extraneous habits and proclivities encroach upon the field of action occupied by this canon, and it presently comes about that the ecclesiastical and sacerdotal structures are partially converted to other uses, in some measure alien to the purposes of the scheme of devout life as it stood in the days of the most vigorous and characteristic development of the priesthood. Well, what have we here? What does this appalling salvo of rhetorical artillery signify? 
what is the sweating professor trying to say what is his message now simply that in the course of time the worship of god is commonly corrupted by other enterprises and that the church ceasing to be a mere temple of adoration becomes the headquarters of these other enterprises more simply still that men sometimes vary serving god by serving other men which means of course serving themselves this bald platitude which must be obvious to any child who has ever been to a church bazaar or a parish house is here tortured worried and run through rollers until it is spread out to two hundred forty one words of which fully two hundred are unnecessary the next paragraph is even worse in it the master undertakes to explain in his peculiar dialect the meaning of that non-reverential sense of aesthetic congruity with the environment which is left as a residue of the latter-day act of worship after elimination of its anthropomorphic content just what does he mean by this non-reverent sense of aesthetic congruity i have studied the whole paragraph for three days halting only for prayer and sleep and i have come to certain conclusions i may be wrong but nevertheless it is the best that i can do what i conclude is this he is trying to say that many people go to church not because they are afraid of the devil but because they enjoy the music and like to look at the stained glass the potted lilies and the reverend pastor to get this profound and highly original observation upon paper he wastes not merely two hundred forty one but more than three hundred words to say what might be said on a postage stamp he takes more than a page in his book and so it goes alas alas in all his other volumes a sense worth of information wrapped in a bale of polysyllables in the higher learning in america the thing perhaps reaches its damnedest and worst it is as if the practice of that incredibly obscure and malodorous style were a relentless disease a sort of progressive intellectual diabetes a leprosy of the horse sense words are flung upon words until all recollection that there must be a meaning in them a ground and excuse for them is lost one wanders in a labyrinth of nouns adjectives verbs pronouns adverbs prepositions conjunctions and participles most of them swollen and nearly all of them unable to walk it is difficult to imagine worse english within the limits of intelligible grammar it is clumsy affected opaque bombastic windy empty it is without grace or distinction and it is often without the most elementary order the learned professor gets himself enmeshed in his gnarled sentences like a bull trapped by barbed wire and his efforts to extricate himself are quite as furious and quite as spectacular he heaves he leaps he writhes at times he seems to be at the point of yelling for the police it is a picture to bemuse the vulgar and to give the judicious grief worse there is nothing at the bottom of all this strident wind music the ideas it is designed to set forth are in the overwhelming main poor ideas and often they are ideas that are almost idiotic one never gets the thrill of sharp and original thinking dexterously put into phrases the concepts underlying say the theory of the leisure class are simply socialism and water the concepts underlying the higher learning in america are so childishly obvious that even the poor drudges who write editorials for newspapers have often voiced them when now and then the professor tires of this emission of stale bosh and attempts flights of a more original character he straightway comes tumbling down into absurdity what the reader then has to struggle with is not only intolerably bad writing but also loose flabby cocksure and preposterous thinking again i take refuge in an example it is from chapter four of the theory of the leisure class the problem before the author here has to do with the social convention which frowns upon the consumption of alcohol by women at least to the extent to which men may consume it decorously well then what is his explanation of this convention here in brief is his process of reasoning one the leisure class which is the predatory class of feudal times reserves all luxuries for itself and disapproves their use by members of the lower classes for this use takes away their charm by taking away their exclusive possession two women are chattels in the possession of the leisure class and hence subject to the rules made for inferiors the patriarchal tradition says that the woman being a chattel 
should consume only what is necessary to her sustenance except so far as her further consumption contributes to the comfort or the good repute of her master three the consumption of alcohol contributes nothing to the comfort or good repute of the woman's master but detracts sensibly from the comfort or pleasure of her master ergo she is forbidden to drink this i believe is a fair specimen of the veblenian ratiocination observe it well for it is typical that is to say it starts off with a gratuitous and highly dubious assumption proceeds to an equally dubious deduction and then ends with a platitude which begs the whole question what sound reason is there for believing that exclusive possession is the hallmark of luxury there is none that i can see it may be true of a few luxuries but it is certainly not true of the most familiar ones do i enjoy a decent bath because i know that john smith cannot afford one or because i delight in being clean do i admire beethoven's fifth symphony because it is incomprehensible to congressmen and methodists or because i genuinely love music do i prefer terrapin a la maryland to fried liver because plough hands must put up with the liver or because the terrapin is intrinsically a more charming dose do i prefer kissing a pretty girl to kissing a charwoman because even a janitor may kiss a charwoman or because the pretty girl looks better smells better and kisses better now and then to be sure the idea of exclusive possession enters into the concept of luxury i may if i am a bibliophile esteem a book because it is a unique first edition i may if i am fond esteem a woman because she smiles on no one else but even here save in a very small minority of cases other attractions plainly enter into the matter it pleases me to have a unique first edition but i wouldn't care anything for a unique first edition of robert w chambers or eleanor glenn the author must have my respect the book must be intrinsically valuable there must be much more to it than its mere uniqueness and if being fond i glory in the exclusive smiles of a certain miss or misses then surely my satisfaction depends chiefly upon the lady herself and not upon my mere monopoly would i delight in the fidelity of the charwoman would it give me any joy to learn that through a sense of duty to me she had ceased to kiss the janitor confronted by such considerations it seems to me that there is little truth left in professor veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous waste that what remains of it after it is practically applied a few times is no more than a wraith of balderdash in so far as it is true it is obvious all the professor accomplishes with it is to take what every one knows and pump it up to such proportions that every one begins to doubt it what could be plainer than his failure in the case just cited he starts off with a platitude and ends in absurdity no one denies i take it that in a clearly limited sense women occupy a place in the world or more accurately aspire to a place in the world that is a good deal like that of a chattel marriage the goal of their only honest and permanent hopes invades their individuality a married woman becomes the function of another individuality thus the appearance she brings to the world is often the mirror of her husband's egoism a rich man hangs his wife with expensive clothes and jewels for the same reason among others that he adorns his own head with a plug hat to notify everybody that he can afford it in brief to excite the envy of socialists but he also does it let us hope for another and far better and more powerful reason to wit that she intrigues him that he delights in her that he loves her and so wants to make her gaudy and happy this reason may not appeal to socialist sociologists in russia according to an old scandal officially endorsed by the british bureau for pulling yankee noses the bolsheviki actually repudiated it as insane nevertheless it continues to appeal very forcibly to the majority of normal husbands in the nations of the west and i am convinced that it is a hundred times as potent as any other reason the american husband in particular dresses his wife like a circus horse not primarily because he wants to display his wealth upon her person but because he is a soft and moony fellow and ever ready to yield to her desires however preposterous if any conception of her as a chattel were actively in him even unconsciously he would be a good deal less her slave as it is her vicarious practice of conspicuous waste commonly reaches such a development that her master himself is forced into renunciations which brings professor dr veblen's theory to self-destruction his final conclusion is as unsound as his premises all it comes to is a plain begging of the question 
Why does a man forbid his wife to drink all the alcohol she can hold? Because, he says, it detracts sensibly from his comfort or pleasure. In other words, it detracts from his comfort and pleasure because it detracts from his comfort and pleasure. Meanwhile, the real answer is so plain that even a professor should know it. A man forbids his wife to drink too much because, deep in his secret archives, he has records of the behavior of other women who drank too much, and is eager to safeguard his wife's self-respect and his own dignity against what he knows to be certain invasion. In brief, it is a commonplace of observation, familiar to all males beyond the age of twenty-one, that once a woman is drunk, the rest is a mere matter of time and place. The girl is already there. A husband, viewing this prospect, perhaps shrinks from having his chattel damaged. But let us be soft enough to think that he may also shrink from seeing humiliation, ridicule, and bitter regret inflicted upon one who is under his protection, and one whose dignity and happiness are precious to him, and one whom he regards with deep, and I surely hope, lasting affection. A man's grandfather is surely not his chattel, even by the terms of the Veblen theory and yet I am sure that no sane man would let the old gentleman go beyond a discreet cocktail or two if a bout of genuine bibbing were certain to be followed by the complete destruction of his dignity, his chastity, and, if a Presbyterian, his immortal soul. One more example of the Veblenian logic, and I must pass on. I have other fish to fry. On page 135 of The Theory of the Leisure Clash, he turns his garish and buzzing searchlight upon another problem of the domestic hearth, this time a double one. First, why do we have lawns around our country houses? Secondly, why don't we employ cows to keep them clipped instead of importing Italians, Croatians, and blackamoors? The first question is answered by an appeal to ethnology. We delight in lawns because we are the descendants of a pastoral people inhabiting a region with a humid climate. True enough, there is in a well-kept lawn an element of sensuous beauty, but that is secondary. The main thing is that our Dolicio blonde ancestors had flocks, and thus took a keen professional interest in grass. The Marx motif, the economic interpretation of history in E-flat. But why don't we keep flocks? Why do we renounce cows and hire Yugoslavs? Because to the average popular apprehension a herd of cattle so pointedly suggests thrift and usefulness that their presence would be intolerably cheap. With the highest veneration, bosh! Plowing through a bad book from end to end, I can find nothing sillier than this. Here, indeed, the whole theory of conspicuous waste is exposed for precisely what it is. One percent platitude and ninety-nine percent nonsense. Has the genial professor pondering his great problems ever taken a walk in the country? And has he, in the course of that walk, ever crossed a pasture inhabited by a cow? Bals Taurus? And has he, making that crossing, ever passed astern of the cow herself? And has he, thus passing astern, ever stepped carelessly and— But this is not a medical work, and so I had better haul up. The cow to me symbolizes the whole speculation of this laborious and humorless pedagogue. From end to end you will find the same tedious torturing of plain facts, the same relentless piling up of thin and over-labored theory— the same flatulent bombast, the same intellectual strabismus, and always with an air of vast importance, always in vexed and formidable sentences, always in the longest words possible, always in the most cacophonous English that even a professor ever wrote. One visualizes him with his head thrown back, searching for cryptic answers in the firmament and not seeing the overt and disconcerting cow, not watching his step. One sees him as the pundit par excellence, infinitely earnest and diligent, infinitely honest and patient, but also infinitely humorous, futile, and hollow. So much, at least for the present, for this professor, Dr. Thorstein Veblen, head great thinker to the parlor radicals, Socrates of the intellectual Greenwich Village, chief star, at least transiently, of the American Athenaeums. I am tempted to crowd in mention of some of his other astounding theories. For example, the theory that the presence of pupils, the labor of teaching, a concern with pedagogy, is necessary to the highest functioning of a scientific investigator, a notion magnificently supported by the examples of Flexner, Ehrlich, Metchnikoff, Loeb, and Carroll. 
I am tempted, too, to devote a third lead to the astounding materialism, almost the downright hoggishness of his whole system, its absolute exclusion of everything approaching an aesthetic motive. But I must leave all these fallacies and absurdities to your own inquiry. More important than any of them, more important as a phenomenon than the professor himself and all his works, is the gravity with which his muddled and highly dubious ideas have been received. At the moment, I dare say, he is in decline. Such great thinkers have a way of going out as quickly as they come in. But a year or so ago he dominated the American scene. All the reviews were full of his ideas. A hundred lesser sages reflected them. Every one of intellectual pretensions read his books. Veblenism was shining in full brilliance. There were Veblenists, Veblen clubs, Veblen remedies for all the sorrows of the world. There were even, in Chicago, Veblen girls, perhaps Gibson girls, grown middle-aged and despairing. The spectacle, unluckily, was not novel. Go back through the history of America since the early nineties, and you will find a long succession of just such violent and uncritical enthusiasms. James had his day. Dewey had his day. Ibsen had his day. Maeterlinck had his day. Almost every year sees another intellectual munion arise with his infallible peruna for all the current malaises. Sometimes this great thinker is imported. Once he was Pastor Wagner. Once he was Bergson. Once he was Eucken. Once he was Tolstoy. Once he was a lady, by name Ellen Key. Again he was another lady, Signorina Montessori but more often he is full of native growth and full of the pervasive cocksureness and superficiality of the land. I do not rank Dr. Veblen among the worst of these horospices, save perhaps as a stylist. I am actually convinced that he belongs among the best of them. But that best is surely depressing enough. What lies behind it is the besetting intellectual sin of the United States, the habit of turning intellectual concepts into emotional concepts, the vice of orgiastic and inflammatory thinking. There is in America no orderly and thorough working out of the fundamental problems of our society. There is only, as one Englishman has said, an eternal combat of crazes. The things of capital importance are habitually discussed, not by men soberly trying to get at the truth about them, but by Bramadism great thinkers trying only to get kudus out of them. We are beset endlessly by quacks, and they are not the less quacks when they happen to be quite honest. In all fields, from politics to pedagogics, and from theology to public hygiene, there is a constant emotional obscuration of the true issues, a violent combat of credulities, an inane debasement of scientific curiosity to the level of mob gaping. The thing to blame, of course, is our lack of an intellectual aristocracy, sound in its information, skeptical in its habit of mind, and above all secure in its position and authority. Every other civilized country has such an aristocracy. It is the natural corrective of enthusiasms from below. It is hospitable to ideas, but is adamant against crazes. It stands against the pollution of logic by emotion, the sophistication of evidence to the glory of God. But in America there is nothing of the sort. On the one hand there is the populace, perhaps more powerful here, more capable of putting its idiotic ideas into execution than anywhere else, and surely more eager to follow platitudinous messiahs. On the other hand there is the ruling plutocracy, ignorant, hostile to inquiry, tyrannical in the exercise of its power, suspicious of ideas of whatever sort. In the middle ground there is little save an indistinct herd of intellectual eunuchs, chiefly professors, often quite as stupid as the plutocracy and always in great fear of it. When it produces a stray rebel he goes over to the mob, there is no place for him within his own order. This feeble and vacillating class, unorganized and without authority, is responsible for what passes as the well-informed opinion of the country, for the sort of opinion that one encounters in the serious periodicals. For what later on leaks down much diluted into the few newspapers that are not frankly imbecile. Dr. Veblen has himself described it in The Higher Learning in America. He is one of its characteristic products, and he proves that he is thoroughly of it by the timorousness he shows in that book. It is in the main only half-educated. It lacks experience of the world, assurance, the consciousness of class solidarity and security. 
of no definite position in our national life, exposed alike to the clamors of the mob and the discipline of the plutocracy, it gets no public respect and is deficient in self-respect. Thus the better sort of men are not tempted to enter it. It recruits only men of feeble courage, men of small originality. Its sublimest flower is the American college president, well described by Dr. Veblen, a perambulating sycophant and platitudinarian, a gaudy mendicant and bounder, engaged all his life not in the battle of ideas, the pursuit and dissemination of knowledge, but in the courting of rich donkeys and the entertainment of mobs. Nay, Veblen is not the worst. Veblen is almost the best. The worst is, but I begin to grow indignant, and indignation, as old Friedrich used to say, is foreign to my nature. End of chapter 5 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 6 of Prejudices, First Series This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken. The New Poetry Movement. The current pother about poetry, now gradually subsiding, seems to have begun about seven years ago, say in 1912. It was during that year that Harriet Monroe established Poetry, a magazine of verse, in Chicago, and ever since then she has been the mother superior of the movement. Other leaders have occasionally disputed her command. The bombastic Braithwaite, with his annual anthology of magazine verse, Amy Lowell, with her solemn pronunciamentos, in the manner of a Harvard professor, Vachel Lindsay, with his nebulous vaporings and Chautauqua posturings, even such cheap jacks as Alfred Kreimborg, out of Greenwich Village. But the importance of Miss Monroe grows more manifest as year chases year. She was, to begin with, clearly the pioneer. Poetry was on the stands nearly two years before the first Braithwaite anthology, and long before Miss Lowell had been lured from her earlier finishing school doggerels by the Franco-British imagists. It antedated, too, all the other salient documents of the movement. Master Spoon River Anthology, Frost's North of Boston, Lindsay's General William Booth Enters Heaven, the historic bulls of the Imagists, the frantic balderdash of the Others Group, Moreover, Miss Monroe has always managed to keep on good terms with all wings of the heaven-kissed host, and has thus managed to exert a ponderable influence both to starboard and to port. This, I dare say, is because she is a very intelligent woman, which fact alone sufficient to give her an austere eminence in a movement so beset by mountebanks and their dupes. I have read poetry since the first number, and find it constantly entertaining. It has printed a great deal of extravagant stuff, and not a little downright nonsensical stuff, but in the main it has steered a safe and intelligible course, with no salient blunders. No other poetry magazine, and there have been dozens of them, have even remotely approached it in interest, or for that matter in genuine hospitality to ideas. Practically all of the others have been operated by passionate enthusiasts, often extremely ignorant and always narrow and humorless. But Miss Monroe has managed to retain a certain judicial calm in the midst of all the whooping and clapper-clawing, and so she has avoided running amuck, and her magazine has printed the very best of the new poetry and avoided much of the worst. As I say, the movement shows signs of having spent its strength. The mere bulk of the verse that it produces is a great deal less than it was three or four years ago or even one or two years ago, and there is a noticeable tendency toward the conservatism once so loftily disdained. I dare say the Kanish Morgan Burlesque of Witter Biner and Arthur Davidson Fick was a hard blow to the more fantastic radicals. At all events, they subsided after it was perpetrated, and for a couple of years nothing has been heard from them. These radicals, chiefly collected in what was called the Others Group, rattled the slapstick in a sort of side show to the main exhibition. 
they attracted of course all the more credulous and uninformed partisans of the movement and not a few advanced professors out of one building universities began to lecture upon them before bucolic women's clubs they committed harikari in the end by beginning to believe in their own bunkum when their leaders took to the chautauquas and sought to convince the peasantry that james whitcomb riley was a fraud the time was ripe for the lethal buffoonery of m m brenner and thick that buffoonery was enormously successful perhaps the best hoax in american literary history it was swallowed indeed by so many magnificals that it made criticism very timorous thereafter and so did damage not to a few quite honest bards to-day a new poet if he departs ever so little from the path already beaten is kept in a sort of literary delousing pen until it is established that he is genuinely sincere and not merely another binner in hempen whiskers and a cloak to go invisible well what is the net produce of the whole uproar how much more actual poetry have all these truculent rebels against stedman's anthology and mcguffey's sixth reader manufactured i suppose i have read nearly all of it a great deal of it as a magazine editor in manuscript and yet as i look back my memory is lighted up by very few flashes of any lasting brilliance the best of all the lutists of the new school i am inclined to think are carl sandberg and james oppenheim and particularly a sandburn he shows a great deal of raucous crudity he is often a bit uncertain and wobbly and sometimes he is downright banal but taking one bard with another he is probably the soundest and most intriguing of the lot compare for example his war poems simple eloquent and extraordinarily moving to the humorless balderdash of amy lowell or to go outside the movement to the childish gush of joyce kilmer herman haggardorn and charles hanson town often he gets memorable effects by astonishingly austere means as in his famous chicago rhapsody and his cool tombs and always he is thoroughly individual a true original his own man oppenheim equally eloquent is more conventional he stands as to one leg on the shoulders of walt whitman and as to the other on a stack of old testaments the stuff he writes despite his belief to the contrary is not american at all it is absolutely jewish levantine almost asiatic but here is something criticism too often forgets the jew intrinsically is the greatest of poets beside his gorgeous rhapsodies the highest flights of any western bard seem feeble and cerebral oppenheim inhabiting a brick house in new york manages to get that sonorous eastern note into his dithyrambs they are often inchoate and feverish but at their best they have the gigantic gusto of solomon's song miss lowell is the schoolmarm of the movement and vastly more the pedagogue than the artist she has written perhaps half a dozen excellent pieces in imitation of richard aldington and john gould fletcher and a great deal of highfalutin bathos her a dome of many-coloured glass is full of infantile poppycock and though it is true that it was first printed in nineteen twelve before she joined the imagists it is not to be forgotten that it was reprinted with her consent in nineteen fifteen after she had definitely set up shop as a foe of the cliche her celebrity i fancy is largely extra poetical if she were miss tilly jones of fort smith arkansas there would be a great deal less rowing about her and her successive masterpieces would be received less gravely a literary craftsman in america as i have already said once or twice is never judged by his work alone miss lowell has been helped very much by her excellent social position the majority and perhaps fully nine-tenths of the revolutionary poets are of no social position at all newspaper reporters jews foreigners of vague nationality school teachers lawyers advertisement writers itinerant lecturers greenwich village posturers and so on i have a suspicion that it has subtly flattered such denizens of the demimonde to find a sister of a president of harvard in their midst and that their delight has materially corrupted their faculties miss lowell's book of exposition 
tendencies in modern american poetry is commonplace to the last degree louis untermeyer's the new era in american poetry is very much better and so is professor dr john livingston lowe's convention and revolt in poetry as for edgar lee masters for a short season the undisputed homer of the movement i believe that he is already extinct what made the fame of the spoon river anthology was not chiefly any great show of novelty in it nor any extraordinary poignancy nor any grim truthfulness unparalleled but simply the public notion that it was improper it fell upon the country at the height of the last sex wave a wave eternally ebbing and flowing now high now low it was read not as work of art but as document its large circulation was undoubtedly mainly among persons to whom poetry qua poetry was as sour a dose as symphonic music to such persons of course it seemed something new under the sun they were unacquainted with the verse of george crabbe they were quite innocent of e a robinson and robert frost they knew nothing of the ubi sunt formula they had never heard of the greek anthology the roar of his popular success won master's case with the critics his undoubted merits in detail his half-wistful cynicism his capacity for evoking simple emotions his deft skill at managing the puny difficulties of vers libre were thereupon pumped up to such an extent that his defects were lost sight of those defects however shine blindingly in his later books without the advantage of content that went with the anthology they reveal themselves as volumes of empty doggerel with now and then a brief moment of illumination it would be difficult indeed to find poetry that is in essence less poetical most of the pieces are actually tracts and many of them are very bad tracts lindsay alas he has done his own burlesque what was new in him at the start was an echo of the barbaric rhythms of the jubilee songs but very soon the thing ceased to be a marvel and of late his elephantine college yells have ceased to be amusing his retirement to the chautauquas is self-criticism of uncommon penetration frost a standard new england poet with a few changes in phraseology and the substitution of sour resignationism for sweet resignationism whittier without the whiskers robinson ditto but with a politer bow he has written sound poetry but not much of it the late major general roosevelt ruined him by praising him as he ruined henry bordeaux pastor wagner francis warrington dawson and many another giovanti a fourth-rate sandford ezra pound the american in headlong flight from america to england to italy to the middle ages to ancient greece to cathay and points east pound it seems to me is the most picturesque man in the whole movement a professor turned fanti abelard in grand opera his knowledge is abysmal he has it readily on tap moreover he has a fine ear and has written many an excellent verse but now all the glow and gusto of the bard have been transformed into the rage of the pamphleteer he drops the lute for the bayonet one sympathizes with him in his collar the stupidity he combats is actually almost unbearable every normal man must be tempted at times to spit on his hands hoist the black flag and begin slitting throats but this business alas is fatal to the placid moods and fine otherworldliness of the poet pound gives a thrilling show but the remaining stars of liberation need not detain us they are the street boys following the calliope they have labored with diligence but they have produced no poetry miss monroe if she would write a book about it would be the most competent historian of the movement and perhaps also its keenest critic she has seen it from the inside she knows precisely what it is about she is able finally to detach herself from its extravagances and to estimate its opponents without bile her failure to do a volume about it leaves untermeyer's the new era in american poetry the best in the field professor dr lowe's treatise 
is very much more thorough but it has the defect of stopping with the fundamentals it has too little to say about specific poets untermeyer discusses all of them and then throws in a dozen or two orthodox bards wholly untouched by bolshevism for good measure his criticism is often trenchant and always very clear he thinks he knows what he thinks he knows and he states it with utmost address sometimes indeed as in the case of pound with a good deal more address than its essential accuracy deserves but the messianic note that gets into the balls and ukases of pound himself the profound solemnity of miss lowell the windy chechaqua like nothings of lindsay the contradictions of the imagists the puerilities of Kramborg et al all these things are happily absent and so it is possible to follow him amiably even when he is palpably wrong that is not seldom at the very start for example he permits himself a lot of highly dubious rumble bumble about the inherent americanism and soaring democracy of the movement once he says the most exclusive and aristocratic of the arts appreciated and fostered only by the salons and erudite groups poetry has suddenly swung away from its self-imposed strictures and is expressing itself once more in terms of democracy pondering excessively i can think of nothing that would be more untrue than this the fact is that the new poetry is neither american nor democratic despite its remote grounding on whitman it started not in the united states at all but in france and its exotic color is still its most salient characteristic practically every one of its practitioners is palpably under some strong foreign influence and most and most of them are no more anglo-saxon than a samovar or a takata the deliberate strangeness of pound his almost fanatical anti-americanism is a mere accentuation of what is in every other member of the fraternity many of them like frost fletcher h d and pound have exiled themselves from the public others such as oppenheim sandberg giovanti benet and untermeyer himself are probably continental europeans often with levantine traces yet others such as miss lowell and masters are little more at their best than translators and adapters from the french from the japanese from the greek even lindsay superficially the most national of them all has also his exotic smear as i have shown let miss lowell herself be a witness we shall see them she says at the opening of her essay on e a robinson ceding more and more to the influence of other alien peoples a glance is sufficient to show the correctness of this observation there is no more inherent americanism in the new poetry than there is in the new american painting and music it lies in fact quite outside the mainstream of american culture nor is it democratic in any intelligible sense the poetry of whittier and longfellow was democratic it voiced the elemental emotions of the masses of the people it was full of their simple rubber-stamp ideas they comprehended it and cherished it and so with the poetry of james whitcomb riley and with that of walt mason and ella wheeler wilcox but the new poetry grounded firmly upon novelty and form and boldness of idea is quite beyond their understanding it seems to them to be idiotic just as the poetry of whitman seemed to them to be idiotic and if they could summon up enough interest in it to examine it at length they would undoubtedly clamour for laws making the confection of it a felony the mistake of untermeyer and of others who talk to the same effect lies in confusing the beliefs of poets and the subject matter of their verse with its position in the national consciousness oppenheim sandberg and lindsay are democrats just as whitman was a democrat but their poetry is no more a democratic phenomenon than his was or than to go to music beethoven's eroica symphony was many of these new poets in truth are ardent enemies of democracy for example pound only one of them has ever actually thought to take his strophes to the vulgar that one is lindsay and there is not the slightest doubt that the yokels welcomed him not because they were interested in his poetry 
but because it struck them as an amazing and perhaps even fascinatingly obscene thing for a sane man to go about the country on any such bizarre and undemocratic business no sound art in fact could possibly be democratic tolstoy wrote a whole book to prove the contrary and only succeeded in making his case absurd the only art that is capable of reaching the homo boobus is art that is already debased and polluted band music official sculpture pears soap painting the popular novel what is honest and worthy of praise in the new poetry is greek to the general and despite much nonsense it seems to me that there is no little in it that is honest and worthy of praise it has for one thing made an effective war upon the cliche and so purged the verse of the nation of much of its own banality in subject and phrase the elegant album pieces of richard henry stoddard and edmund clarence stedman are no longer in fashion save perhaps among the democrats that untermeyer mentions and in the second place it has substituted for this ancient conventionality an eager curiosity in life as men and women are actually living it a spirit of daring experimentation that has made poetry vivid and full of human interest as it was in the days of elizabeth the thing often passes into the grotesque it is shot through and through with heliogabalisme but at its high points it has achieved invaluable pioneering a new poet emerging out of the baptist night of peoria or little rock to-day comes into an atmosphere charged with subtle electricities there is a stimulating restlessness ideas have a welcome the art he aspires to is no longer a merely formal exercise like practicing churning when a henry van dyke arises at some college banquet and begins to discharge an old-fashioned ode to alma mater there is a definite snicker it is almost as if he were to appear in congress gaiters or a beaver hat an audience for such things of course still exists it is no doubt an enormously large audience but it has changed a good deal qualitatively if not quantitatively the relatively civilized reader has been educated to something better he has heard a music that has spoiled his ear for the old wheezing of the melodeon he weeps no more over what wrung him yesteryear unluckily the new movement in america even more than in england france and germany suffers from a very crippling lack and that is the lack of a genuinely first-rate poet it has produced many talents but it has yet to produce any genius or even the shadow of genius there has been a general lifting of the plain but no vasty and melodramatic throwing up of new peaks where still it has had to face hard competition from without that is from poets who while also emerged from platitude have yet stood outside it and perhaps in some doubt of it untermeyer discusses a number of such poets in his book there is one of them lizette woodworth reese who has written more sound poetry more genuinely eloquent and beautiful poetry than all the new poets put together more than a whole posse of masterses and lindsays more than a hundred amy lowells and there are others nyhart and john mcclure among them particularly mcclure untermeyer usually anything but an ass once committed the unforgettable asininity of sneering at mcclure the blunder i dare say is already lamented it is not embalmed in his book but it will haunt him on tyburn hill for this mcclure attempting the simplest thing in the simplest way has done it almost superbly he seems to be entirely without theories there is no pedagogical passion in him he is no reformer but more than any of his reformers now are lately in the arena he is a poet End of chapter 6chapter 7 of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by karen malazzi massachusetts prejudices first series by h l mencken chapter 7 the heir of mark twain 
Nothing could be stranger than the current celebrity of Irvin S. Cobb, an author of whom almost as much is heard as if he were a new Thackeray or Moliere. One is solemnly told by various extravagant partisans, some of them not otherwise insane, that he is at once the successor to Mark Twain and the heir of Edgar Allan Poe. One hears of public dinners given in devotion to his genius, of public presentations, of learned degrees conferred upon him by universities, of other extraordinary adulations, few of them shared by such relatively puny fellows as Howells and Dreiser. His talents and sagacity pass into popular anecdotes. He has sedulous Boswells. He begins to take on the august importance of an actor-manager. Behind the scenes, of course, a highly dexterous publisher pulls the strings, but much of it is undoubtedly more or less sincere. Men pledge their sacred honor to the doctrine that his existence honors the national literature. Moreover, he seems to take the thing somewhat seriously himself. He gives his imprimatur to various other authors, including Joseph Conrad. He engages himself to lift the literary tone of moving pictures. He lends his name to movements. He exposes himself in the Chautauquas. He takes on the responsibilities of a patriot and a public man. Altogether, a curious, and in some of its aspects, a caressingly ironical spectacle. One wonders what the graduate sophomores of tomorrow, composing their dull tones upon American letters, will make of it. In the actual books of the man, I can find nothing that seems to justify so much enthusiasm, nor even the hundredth part of it. His serious fiction shows a certain undoubted facility, but there are at least forty other Americans who do the thing quite as well. His public bulls and ukazes are no more than clever journalism superficial and inconsequential, first saying one thing and then quite another thing. And in his humor, which his admirers apparently put first among his products, I can discover, at best, nothing save a somewhat familiar aptitude for grotesque anecdote, and at worst, only the laborious laugh-squeezing of Bill Nye. In the volume called Those Times and These, there is an excellent comic story, to wit, Hark from the Tomb. But it would surely be an imbecility to call it a masterpiece. Too many other authors have done things quite as good, more than a few. I need cite only George Ade, Owen Johnson, and Ring W. Lardner, have done things very much better. Worse, it lies in the book like a slice of Smithfield ham between two slabs of stale store bread. On both sides of it are very stupid artificialities, stories without point, stories in which rustic characters try to talk like Wilson Misner, stories altogether machine-made and depressing. Turn now to another book, vastly praised in its year by name, Cobb's Anatomy. One laughs occasionally, but precisely as one laughs over a comic supplement or the jokes in Ayer's Almanac. For example, there never was a handsome cab made that would hold a fat man comfortably unless he left the doors open, and that makes him feel undressed. Again, your hair gives you bother so long as you have it, and more bother when it starts to go. You're always doing something for it, and it is always showing deep-dyed ingratitude in return, or else the dye isn't deep enough, which is even worse. Exactly. It is even worse. And then this. Once there was a manicure lady who wouldn't take a tip, but she is now no more. Her indignant sisters stabbed her to death with hat pins and nail files. I do not think I quote unfairly. I have tried to select honest specimens of the author's fancy. Perhaps it may be well to glance at another book. I choose at random speaking of operations, a work described by the publisher as the funniest yet written by Cobb and the funniest book we know of. In this judgment, many other persons seem to have concurred. The thing was an undoubted success when it appeared as an article in the Saturday Evening Post, and it sold thousands of copies between covers. Well, what is in it? In it, after a diligent reading, I find half a dozen mildly clever observations and sixty-odd pages of ancient and infantile wheezes, as flat to the taste as so many crystals of hyposulfite of silver. For example, the wheeze to the effect that in the days of the author's nonage, germs had not been invented yet. For example, the wheeze to the effect that doctors bury their mistakes. For example, the wheeze to the effect that the old-time doctor always prescribed medicines of abominably evil flavor. But let us go into the volume more in detail, and so unearth all its gems. On page one, in the very first paragraph, there is the doddering old joke about the steepness of doctor's bills. In the second paragraph, there is the somewhat newer but still fully adult joke about the extreme willingness of persons who have been butchered by surgeons to talk about it afterward. These two witticisms are all that I can find on page one. For the rest, it consists almost entirely of a reference to M.M. M. Bryan and Roosevelt. 
a reference well known by all newspaper paragraphists and vaudeville monologists to be as provocative of laughter as a mention of Bunyan's Mothers-in-Law or Pottstown, Pennsylvania. On page two, Brian and Roosevelt are succeeded by certain heavy stuff in the Petroleum V Nasby manner, upon the condition of obstetrics, pediatrics, and the allied sciences among whales. Page three starts off with the old jocosity to the effect that people talk too much about the weather. It progresses, or resolves, as the musicians say, into the wheeze to the effect that people like to dispute over what is the best thing to eat for breakfast. On page four, we come to what musicians would call the formal statement of the main theme, that is, of the how I like to talk of my operation motif. We have thus covered four pages. Page five starts out with an inharmonic change, to wit, from the idea that ex-patients like to talk of their operations to the idea that patients in being like to swap symptoms. Following this, there is a repetition of the gold theme, that is, the theme of the doctor's bill. On page six, there are two chuckles. One springs out of a reference to light housekeeping, a phrase which invariably strikes an American vaudeville audience as salaciously whimsical. The other is grounded upon the well-known desire of baseball fans to cut the umpire's throat. On page six, there enters for the first time what may be called the second theme of the book. This is the whiskers motif. The whole of this page, with the exception of a sentence embodying the old wheeze about the happy times before germs were invented, is given over to variations of the Whiskers joke. Page 8 continues this development section. Whiskers of various fantastic varieties are mentioned. Trellis whiskers, bosky whiskers, ambush whiskers, loose, luxuriant whiskers, landscaped whiskers, whiskers that are winter quarters for pathogenic organisms. Some hard, hard squeezing, and the humor in whiskers is temporarily exhausted. Page 8 closes with the old joke about the cruel thumping which doctors perform upon their patients' clavicles. Now for page 9. It opens with a third installment of the gold motif. He then took my temperature and $15. Following comes the dentist's office motif, that is, the motif of reluctance, of oozing courage, of flight. At the bottom of the page, the gold motif is repeated in the key of E minor. Pages 10 and 11 are devoted to simple description with very little effort at humor. On page 12, there is a second statement for the full brass choir of the dentist's office motif. On page 13, there are more echoes from Petroleum V Nasby, the subject this time being a man who got his spleen back from the doctors and now keeps it in a bottle of alcohol. On page 14, one finds the innocent bystander joke. On page 15, the joke about the terrifying effects of reading a patent medicine almanac. Also, at the bottom of the page, there is a third statement of the dentist's office joke. On page 16, it gives way to a restatement of the whiskers theme, in augmentation, which in turn yields to the third or fifth restatement of the gold theme. Let us now jump a few pages. On page 19, we come to the old joke about the talkative barber. On page 22, to the joke about the book agent. On the same page, to the joke about the fashionableness of appendicitis. On page 23, to the joke about the clumsy carver who projects the turkey's gizzard into the visiting pastor's eye. On page 28, to a restatement of the barber joke. On page 31, to another statement, is it the fifth or sixth, of the dentist's office joke. On page 37, to the cats and jammer joke. On page 39, to the old joke about doctors burying their mistakes. And so on, 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 and so on. On pages 48 and 49, there is a perfect riot of old jokes, including the nth variation of the whiskers joke and a fearful and wonderful pun about Belgian hares and heirs. On second thoughts, I go no further. This, remember, is the book that Cobb's publishers, apparently with his own Nihil Obstat, chose as his best. This is the official masterpiece of the new Mark Twain. Nevertheless, even so laboriously flabby a farcer has his moments, I turn to Frank J. Wilstack's Dictionary of Similes and find this credited to him. No more privacy than a goldfish. Here at last is something genuinely humorous. Here, moreover, is something apparently new. End of chapter 7. Recording by Karen Malazzi, Massachusetts. Chapter 8 of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Prejudices, First Series, by
by h l mencken chapter eight hermann sudermann the fact that sudermann is the author of the most successful play that has come out of germany since the collapse of the romantic movement is the most eloquent of all proofs perhaps of his lack of force and originality as a dramatist heimat englished frenched and italianized as magda gave a new and gaudy leading role to all the middle-aged chewers of scenery they fell upon it as a new marguerite gautier and with it they coaxed the tears of all nations that was in the middle nineties to-day the piece seems almost as old-fashioned as the princess bonnie and even in germany it has gone under the counter if it is brought out at all it is to adorn the death agonies of some doddering star of the last generation sudermann was one of the first deer flushed by arno holz and johannes schlaff the founders of german naturalism he had written a couple of successful novels frau sorge and der katzensteg before the uberbrettel got on its legs and so he was a recruit worth snaring the initial fruit of his enlistment was die Ehre, a reductio ad absurdum of prussian notions of honor as incomprehensible outside of germany as franz adam berlein's zaffenstreich or karl bleibtreu's die edelson der nation then followed sodom's ende and after it heimat already the emptiness of naturalism was beginning to oppress sudermann as it was also oppressing hauptmann the latter in eighteen ninety two rebounded from it to the unblushing romanticism of hanelis himmelfart as for sudermann he chose to temper the rigors of the schlaff holz formula by ibsen out of zola with sardoodledom the result was this heimat in which naturalism was wedded to a mellow sentimentality caressing to audiences bred upon the drama of perfumed adultery the whole last scene of the play indeed was no more than an echo of auger's le marriage d'olympe it is no wonder that even sarah bernhardt pronounced it a great work since then sudermann has wobbled and in the novel as well as in the drama lacking the uncanny versatility of hauptmann he has been unable to conquer the two fields of romance and reality instead he has lost himself between them a rat without a tail das hoch lied his most successful novel since frau sorge is anything but a first-rate work its opening chapter is a superlatively fine piece of writing but after that he grows uncertain of his way and toward the end one begins to wonder what it is all about no coherent idea is in it it is simply a sentimentalization of the unpleasant if it were not for the naughtiness of some of the scenes no one would read it an american dramatist has made a play of it a shocker for the same clowns who were entranced by Brose Le Avres. The trouble with Sudermann, here and elsewhere, is that he has no sound underpinnings, and is a bit uncertain about his characters and his story. He starts off furiously, let us say, as a Zola, and then dilutes Zolaism with romance, and then pulls himself up and begins to imitate ibsen and then trips and falls headlong into the sugar-bowl 
of sentimentality lily says Penac in das hohe lied swoons at critical moments like the heroine of a tale for chambermaids it is almost as if lord jim should get converted at a gospel mission or nora helmer let down her hair but these are defects in sudermann the novelist and dramatist and in that sudermann only in the short story they conceal themselves he is done before he begins to vacillate in this field indeed all his virtues of brisk incisive writing of flashing observation of dexterous stage management of emotional fire and address have a chance to show themselves and without any wearing thin the book translated as the indian lily contains some of the best short stories that german or any other language for that matter can offer they are more than succinct and extraordinarily vivid character studies each full of penetrating irony and sardonic pity each with the chill wind of disillusion blowing through it each preaching that life is a hideous farce that good and bad are almost meaningless words that truth is only the lie that is easiest to believe it is hard to choose between stories so high in merit but surely the purpose is one of the best and all the latter-day germans only ludwig thoma in ein bayerischer soldat has ever got a more brilliant reality into a crowded space here in less than fifteen thousand words sudermann rehearses the tragedy of a whole life and so great is the art of the thing that one gets a sense of perfect completeness almost of exhaustiveness antony wiesner the daughter of a country innkeeper falls in love with robert messerschmidt a medical student and they sin the scarlet sin to robert perhaps the thing is a mere interlude of midsummer but to tony it is all life's meaning and glory robert is poor and his degree is still two years ahead it is out of the question for him to marry very well Tony will find a father for her child. She is her lover's property, and that property must be protected. And she will wait willingly, careless of the years, for the distant day of triumph and redemption. All other ideas and ideals drop out of her mind. She becomes an automaton, moved by the one impulse, the one yearning she marries one weigand a decayed innkeeper he poor fool accepts the parentage of her child her father rich and unsuspicious buys them a likely inn they begin to make money and then begins the second chapter of tony's sacrifice she robs her husband systematically and steadily she takes commissions on all his goods she becomes the uri of his bar that trade may grow and pickings increase mark by mark the money goes to robert it sees him through the university it gives him his year or two in the hospitals it buys him a practice it feeds and clothes him and his mother with him the months and years pass endlessly the young doctor's progress is slow but finally the great day approaches soon robert will be ready for his wife but weigand what of him tony thinks of half a dozen plans the notion of poisoning him gradually formulates itself not a touch of horror stays her she is by this time beyond all the common moralities 
a monomaniac with no thought for anything save her great purpose but an accident saved Phygon. tony too elaborate in her plans poisons herself by mischance and comes near dying very well if not poison than some more subtle craft. She puts a barmaid into Wigan's path. She manages the whole affair. Before long, she sees her victim safely enmeshed. A divorce follows. The inn is sold. Her father's death makes her suddenly rich. At last, she is off to greet her lord. That meeting... Tony waits in the little flat that she has rented in the city. She and her child, the child of Robert. Robert is to come at noon, as the slow moments pass the burden of her happiness seems too great to bear. Then, suddenly, the ecstatic climax, the ring at the door. A gentleman entered, a strange gentleman, wholly strange. Had she met him on the street, she would have not known him. He had grown old, forty, fifty, a hundred years. Yet his real age could not be over twenty-eight. He had grown fat. He carried a little paunch around with him, round and comfortable, and the honorable scars gleamed in round red cheeks his eyes seemed small and receding and when he said here i am at last it was no longer the old voice clear and a little resonant which had echoed and re-echoed in her spiritual ear he gurgled as though he had swallowed dumplings an oaf without an oaf within tony is for splendors triumphs the life robert has settled down his remote village hard by the russian border is to his liking he has made comfortable friends there he is building up a practice he is of course a man of honor he will marry tony willingly and with gratitude even with genuine affection going further he will pay back to her every cent that ever came from Wigan's till. He has kept a strict account. Here it is in a little blue notebook, seven years of entries. As he reads them aloud, the events of those seven years unroll themselves before Tony, and every mark brings up its picture. Stolen cash and trinkets, savings in railroad fares and food, commissions upon furniture and wines profits of champagne debauches with the county councillor sharp trading in milk and eggs suspense and longing in inextricable web of falsification and trickery of terror and lying without end the memory of no guilt is spared her robert is an honest an honorable man he has kept strict account the money is waiting in bank what is more he will make all necessary confessions he has not perhaps kept to the letter of fidelity there was a waitress in berlin it was a nurse at the surgical clinic there is even now a lithuanian servant girl at his bachelor quarters the last named of course will be sent away forthwith robert is a man of honor a man sensitive to every requirement of the punctilio a gentleman he will order the announcement cards consult a clergyman and not forget to get rid of the lithuanian and air the house poor tony stares at him as he departs will he come back soon asks the child i scarcely think so she answers that night she broke the purpose of her life the purpose that had become interwoven with a thousand others and when the morning came 
she wrote a letter of farewell to the beloved of her youth a short story of rare and excellent quality a short story oh miracle worth reading twice it is not so much that its motive is new that motive indeed has appeared in fiction many times though usually with the man as the protagonist as that its workmanship is superb sudermann here shows that for all his failings elsewhere he knows superlatively how to write his act divisions are exactly right his scenes up there are magnificently managed he has got into the thing that rhythmic ebb and flow of emotion which makes for great drama and in most of the other stories in this book you will find much the same skill no other perhaps is quite as good as the purpose but at least one of them the song of death is not far behind here we have the tragedy of a woman brought up rigorously puritanically stupidly who discovers just as it is too late that love may be a wild dance an ecstasy an orgy i can imagine no more grotesquely pathetic scene than that which shows this drab preacher's wife watching by her husband's deathbed while through the door comes the sound of amorous delirium from the next room and then there is a strangely moving christmas story merry folk pathos with the hard iron in it and there are autumn and the indian lily elegies to lost youth the first of them almost a fit compliment to joseph conrad's great pain to youth triumphant altogether a collection of short stories of the very first rank right off das hohe lied frau soge and all the plays a pseudomon remains who must be put in a high and honorable place and will be remembered end of chapter eight chapter nine of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california prejudices first series by h l mencken chapter nine george aid when after the japs and their vassals conquer us and put us to the sword and the republic descends into hell some literary don of oxford or middle europa proceeds to the predestined autopsy upon our complete works one of the things he will surely notice reviewing our literary history is the curious persistence with which the dons native to the land have overlooked its emergence of men of letters i mean of course its genuine men of letters its salient and truly original men its men of intrinsic and unmistakable distinction the fourth raiders have fared well enough god knows go back to any standard literature book of ten or twenty or thirty or fifty years ago and you will be amazed by its praise of shoddy mediocrities long since fly-blown and forgotten george william curtis now seldom heard of at all save perhaps in the reminiscences of senile publishers was treated in his day with all the deference due to a prince of the blood artemus ward petroleum v nasby and half a dozen other such hollow buffoons were ranked with mark twain 
and even above him frank r stockton for thirty years was the delight of all right-thinking reviewers richard henry stoddard and edmund clarence stedman were eminent personages both as critics and as poets and donald g mitchell to make an end of dull names bulked so grandly in the academic eye that he was snatched from his tear jugs and his teapots to become a charter member of the national institutes of arts and letters actually died a member of the american academy meanwhile three of the five indubitably first-rate artists that america has produced went quite without orthodox recognition at home until either foreign enthusiasm or domestic clamor from below forced them into a belated and grudging sort of notice i need not say that i allude to poe whitman and mark twain if it ever occurred to any american critic of position during poe's lifetime that he was a greater man than either cooper or irving then i have been unable to find any trace of the fact in the critical literature of the time the truth is that he was looked upon as a facile and somewhat dubious journalist too cocksure by half and not a man to be encouraged lowell praised him in eighteen forty five and at the same time denounced the current overpraise of lesser men but later on this encomium was diluted with very important reservations and there the matter stood until baudelaire discovered the poet and his belated fame came winging home whitman as every one knows faced even worse emerson first hailed him and then turned tail upon him eager to avoid any share in his ill repute among blockheads no other critic of any influence gave him help he was carried through his dark days of poverty and persecution by a few private enthusiasts none of them with the ear of the public and in the end it was frenchmen and englishmen who lifted him into the light imagine a harvard professor lecturing upon him in eighteen sixty five as for mark twain the story of his first fifteen years has been admirably told by professor dr william lyon phelps of yale the dons were unanimously against him some sneered at him as a feeble mountbank others refused to discuss him at all not one harbored the slightest suspicion that he was a man of genius or even one leg of a man of genius phelps makes merry over this academic attempt to dispose of mark by putting him into coventry and himself joins the sectimonious brethren who essay the same enterprise against dreiser i come by this route to george ade who perhaps fails to fit into the argument doubly for on the one hand he is certainly not a literary artist of the first rank and on the other hand he has long enjoyed a meed of appreciation and even honor for the national institute of arts and letters elevated him to its gilt-edged purple in its first days and he is still on its roll of men of notable achievement in art music and literature along with robert w chambers henry sidnor harrison oliver herford e s martin and e w townsend author of chimmy fadden nevertheless 
he does not fall too far outside after all for if he is not of the first rank then he surely deserves a respectable place in the second rank and if the national institute broke the spell by admitting him then it was probably on the theory that he was a second chambers or hereford or maybe even a second martin or townsend as for the textbook dons they hold resolutely to the doctrine that he scarcely exists and is not worth noticing at all for example there is professor fred lewis patty author of a history of american literature since eighteen seventy professor patty notices chambers marion harland herford townsend amelie rives r k munkertrick and many other such ornaments of the national letters and even has polite bows for gellett burgess carolyn wells and john kendrick bangs but the name of aid is missing from his index as is that of dreiser so with the other pedagogues they are unanimously shy of aid in their horn books for sophomores and they are gingerly in their praise of him in their innumerable review articles he is commended when at all much as the late joseph jefferson used to be commended that is to the accompaniment of reminders that even a clown is one of god's creatures and may have the heart of a christian under his motley the most laudatory thing ever said of him by any critic of the apostolic succession so far as i can discover is that he is clean that he does not import the lewd buffooneries of the barroom the smoking car and the wedding reception into his books but what are the facts the facts are that aid is one of the few genuinely original literary craftsmen now in practice among us that he comes nearer to making literature when he has full steam up than any save a scant half dozen of our current novelists and that the whole body of his work both in books and for the stage is as thoroughly american in cut and color in tang and savor in structure and point of view as the work of howells e w howe or mark twain no single american novel that i can think of shows half the sense of nationality the keen feeling for national prejudice and peculiarity the sharp and pervasive americanism of such Adian fables as the good fairy of the eighth ward and the dollar excursion of the steam fitters the mandolin players and the willing performer and the adult girl who got busy before they could ring the bell on her here amid a humor so grotesque that it almost tortures the midriff there is a startlingly vivid and accurate evocation of the american scene here under all the labored extravagance there are brilliant flashlight pictures of the american people and american ways of thinking and the whole of american culture here the veritable americano stands forth lacking not a waggery a superstition a snuffle or a wen aid himself for all his story-teller's pretense of remoteness is as absolutely american as any of his prairie town traders and pushers shylocks and dogberries bow and bells no other writer of our generation save perhaps howe is more unescapably national in his every gesture and trick of mind 
he is as american as buckwheat cakes or the knights of pythias or the chautauqua or billy sunday or a bull by dr wilson he fairly reeks of the national philistinism the national respect for respectability the national distrust of ideas he is a marcher one fancies in parades he joins movements and movements against movements he knows no language save his own he regards a roosevelt quite seriously and a mozart or an ibsen as a joke one would not be surprised to hear that until he went off to his freshwater college he slept in his underwear and read the epworth herald but like dreiser he is a peasant touched by the divine fire somehow a great instinctive artist got himself born out there on that lush indiana farm he has the rare faculty of seeing accurately even when the thing seen is directly under his nose and he has the still rarer faculty of recording vividly of making the thing seen move with life one often doubts a character in a novel even in a good novel but who ever doubted gus in the two mandolin players or may in sister may or to pass from the fables payson in mr payson's satirical christmas here with stokes so crude and obvious that they seem to be laid on with a broom aid achieves what o henry with all his ingenuity always failed to achieve he fills his bizarre tales with human beings there is never any artfulness on the surface the tale itself is never novel or complex it never surprises often it is downright banal but underneath there is an artfulness infinitely well wrought and that is the artfulness of a story-teller who dredges his story out of his people swiftly and skilfully and does not squeeze his people into his story laboriously and unconvincingly needless to say a moralist stands behind the comedian he would teach he even grows indignant roaring like a yokel at a burlesque show over such wild and light-hearted jocosities as paducah's favorite comedian and why gondola was put away one turns with something of a start to such things as little looty the honest money-maker and the corporation director and the mislaid ambition up to a certain point it is all laughter but after that there is a flash of the knife a show of teeth here a national limitation often closes in upon the satirist he cannot quite separate the unaccustomed from the abominable he is unable to avoid rattling his philistine trappings a bit proudly he must prove that he too is a right-thinking american a solid citizen and a patriot unshaken in his lofty rectitude by such poisons as aristocracy adultery or divers and the sonata form but in other directions this thoroughgoing nationalism helps him rather than hinders him it enables him for one thing to see into sentimentality and to comprehend it and project it accurately i know of no book which displays the mooniness of youth with more feeling and sympathy than arty save it be frank norris's forgotten blicks in such fields 
aid achieves a success that is rare and indubitable he makes the thing charming as he makes it plain but all these fables and other compositions of his are mere sketches inconsiderable trifles impromptus in bad english easy to write and of no importance are they indeed do not believe it for a moment fifteen or twenty years ago when aid was at the height of his celebrity as a newspaper skenarel scores of hack comedians tried to imitate him and all failed i myself was of the number i operated a so-called funny column in a daily newspaper and like my colleagues near and far i essayed to manufacture fables in slang what miserable botches they were how easy it was to imitate aid's manner and how impossible to imitate his matter no please don't get the notion that it is a simple thing to write such a fable as that of the all-night seance and the limit that ceased to be or that of the preacher who flew his kite but not because he wished to do so or that of the roistering blades far from it on the contrary the only way you will ever accomplish the feat will be by first getting aid's firm grasp upon american character and his ability to think out a straightforward simple amusing story and his alert feeling for contrast and climax and his extraordinary talent for devising novel vivid and unforgettable phrases those phrases of his sometimes wear the external vestments of a passing slang that they are no more commonplace and vulgar at bottom than gray's mute inglorious milton or the somewheres east of suez of kipling they reduce an idea to a few pregnant syllables they give the attention a fillet and light up a whole scene in a flash they are the running evidences of an eye that sees clearly and of a mind that thinks shrewdly they give distinction to the work of a man who has so well concealed a highly complex and efficient artistry that few have ever noticed it End of chapter fifteen chapter ten of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california prejudices first series by h l mencken chapter ten the butte bashkirt of all the pseudo rebels who have raised a tarleton black flag in these states surely mary mclean is one of the most pathetic when at nineteen she fluttered vassar with the story of mary mclean the truth about her was still left somewhat obscure the charm of her flapperhood so to speak distracted attention from it and so concealed it but when at thirty-five she achieved i mary mclean it emerged crystal clear she had learned to describe her malady accurately though she still wondered a bit wistfully just what it was and that melody that truth simply that a scotch presbyterian with a soaring soul is as cruelly beset as a wolf with fleas 
a zebra with the bots let a spark of the divine fire spring to life in that arid corpse and it must fight its way to flame through a drum fire of wet sponges a hummingbird immersed in cartoffelsupa walter pater writing for the london daily mail leculus travelling steerage a puritan wooed and tortured by the leers of beauty mary mclean in a moral republic in a presbyterian diocese in butte i hope my figures of speech are not too abstruse what i mean to say is simply this that the secret of mary mclean is simply this that the origin of all her inchoate naughtiness is simply this that she is a puritan who has heard the call of joy and is struggling against it damnably remember so much and the whole of her wistful heresy becomes intelligible on the one hand the loveliness of the world enchants her on the other hand the fires of hell warn her this tortuous conflict accounts for her whole bag of tricks her timorous flirtations with the devil her occasional outbreaks of finishing school rebellion her hurried protestations of virginity above all her incurable philistinism one need not be told that she admires the late major general roosevelt and mrs atherton that she wallows in the poetry of keats one knows quite as well that her phonograph plays the pier gint suite and that she is charmed by the syllogisms of g k chesterton she is in brief an absolutely typical american of the transition stage between christian endeavor and civilization there is in her a definite poison of ideas an aesthetic impulse that will not down but every time she yields to it she is halted and plucked back by qualms and doubts by the dominant superstitions of her race and time by the dead hand of her kirk crazy scotch forebears it is precisely this grisly touch upon her shoulder that stimulates her to those naive explosions of scandalous confidence which made her what she is if there were no sepulchral voice in her ear warning her that it is the mark of a hussy to be kissed by a man with iron-gray hair a brow like apollo and a jowl like bill sykes she would not confess it and boast of it as she does on page one hundred and twenty one of i mary mclean if it were not a presbyterian axiom that a lady who says damn is fit only to join the white slaves she would not pen a defiant damniad as she does on pages one hundred and eight one hundred and nine and one hundred and ten and if it were not held universally in butte that sex passion is the exclusive infirmity of the male she would not blab out in meeting that but here i get into forbidden waters and had better refer to you to page two hundred and nine it is not the godless voluptuary who patronizes leg shows and the cabaret it is the methodist deacon with unaccustomed vine leaves in his hair it is not genuine artists serving beauty reverently and proudly who herd in greenwich village and ball for art it is precisely a mob of middle western baptists to whom the very idea of art is still novel and intoxicating and more than a little bawdy and to make an end 
it is not cocottes who read the highly spiced magazine which burden all the bookstalls it is sedentary married women who while faithful to their depressing husbands in the flesh yet allow their imaginations to play furtively upon the charms of theoretical intrigues with such pretty fellows as francis x bushman enrico caruso and vincent astor an understanding of this plain fact not only explains the mclean and her gingery carnalities of the chair it also explains a good part of latter-day american literature that literature is the self-expression of a people who have got only halfway up the ladder leading from moral slavery to intellectual freedom at every step there is a warning tug a protest from below sometimes the climber docilely drops back sometimes he emits a petulant defiance and reaches boldly for the next round it is this occasional defiance which accounts for the periodical efflorescence of mere schoolboy naughtiness in the midst of our oleaginous virtue for the shouldering out of the ladies home journal by magazines of adultery all compact for the provocative bearing of calf and scapula by women who regard it as immoral to take benedictine with their coffee for the peopling of greenwich village by oafs who think it a devilish adventure to victual in cellars and read craft ebbing and stare at the corset scarred nakedness of decadent cloak models i have said that the climber is but halfway up the ladder i wish i could add that he is moving ahead but the truth is that he is probably quite stationary we have our spasms of revolt our flarings up of peekaboo waists free love and art but a mighty backwash of piety fetches each and every one of them soon or late a mongrel and inferior people incapable of any spiritual aspiration above that of second-rate english colonials we seek refuge inevitably in the one sort of superiority that the lower castes of men can authentically boast to wit superiority in docility in credulity in resignation in morals we are the most moral race in the world there is not another that we do not look down upon in that department our confessed aim and destiny as a nation is to inoculate them all with our incomparable rectitude in the last analysis all ideas are judged among us by moral standards moral values are our only permanent tests of worth whether in the arts in politics in philosophy or in life itself even the instincts of man so intrinsically immoral so innocent are fitted with moral false faces that bedevilment by sex ideas which punishes continence so abhorrent to nature is converted into a moral frenzy pathological in the end the impulse to cavort and kick up one's legs so healthy so universal is hedged in by incomprehensible taboos it becomes stealthy dirty degrading the desire to create and linger over beauty the sign and touchstone of man's rise above the brute is held down by doubts and hesitations when it breaks through it must do so by orgy 
and explosion half ludicrous and half pathetic our function we choose to believe is to teach and inspire the world we are wrong our function is to amuse the world we are the bryan the henry ford the billy sunday among the nations End of chapter 10